warmly welcome to this program and it is a singular honor to introduce to you uh, Mrs. Sipiwe Ndolovu and Marlene Schneider. I wish you a fruitful discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Welcome everybody. Welcome the people of Gloria and Joko to the Sacred Book Festival Thanks. and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. The book we are going to talk about is called The Theory of Flight, which is your debut novel, yes. published last year by Penguin in South Africa. Uh, but first, let me introduce you uh, to the audience. The Pierre Gloria Glovo is a Zimbabwean writer, filmmaker, and an academic. She holds a PhD in modern thinking and literature from Stanford University and a master's degree in African studies and film. She won the Silver Dow, an award at the Zanzibar International Film Festival for her short film Graffiti, and she's currently working on her third novel, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So the novel, The Theory of Light, is basically about the life of Jeannie, a girl who grows up on a farm in a South African country after a war for liberation. Jeannie is said to be born as a golden egg. Her father is a freedom fighter. Her mother is a country and western singer who dreams of traveling to Nashville. When Jeannie is a child, her parents go missing, and she believes that they have flown away on a pair of silver wings. And Jeannie believes in that because her father had spent lots of his lifetime trying to build an aeroplane so that, he says, when independence arrives, people would know they are capable of flight. The story of Jeannie takes the reader through several decades of the country's history, from colonialism to independence to the post-colonial era, and the story also portrays all the people Jeannie encounters, her family, her friends, and the people who live on the farm and the city. And at the end, the reader has read a beautiful story about love and loss, about atrocities, about freedom, and obviously it's a story full of magic. <laughs> So what inspired you to write this kind of story? Um, so in November, uh, November 7th, 2007, um, I got a call from my mother early in the morning. I was um, at university at the time at Stanford, so there was an hour difference. There were hours of difference in time. So I thought if she's calling this early, it must be something either very bad or very good. Um, and so I picked up the phone and she told me that my aunt had passed away. And uh, my aunt was four years older than me. At the time she was 34. And at that time the life expectancy of a Zimbabwean woman was 34. And the reason that that expectancy was 34 was because of HIV and AIDS. Um, and so I had to sort of like find a way to deal with the loss of someone that had been my older sister. All of a sudden, I hadn't been expecting it. No one had been expecting it. It was very sudden. And um, for years, you know, I was very angry. And I, um, like, very sudden loss, you don't really know how to respond. Um, and so I was very angry, and I didn't know what to do. But it also struck me that at 34 meant that she had sort of, like, not even lived out a generation, like 30, 30 to 35 is a generation. And in that, the span of her life, um, she had been sort of like born during a war. Um, there had been a genocide that happened during her lifetime, and then HIV had claimed her life. And so I thought this is sort of like within someone's lifespan or within a generation, all these horrible things have happened, and this has happened to us as a people. So how have we sort of like sort of like metabolized that and processed that as a people, and how can we move on? And so that's how it was came about. And the story is set in an unnamed South African, Southern African country, mm -hmm. but one could assume it is Zimbabwe. So why is the setting so vague? Why did you leave it open? Um, there, there are many reasons. I think one of the reasons is I don't really name the country is because at the time that I'm writing about the story, the country is actually going through a transitional period. So it's going from being Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. <coughs> Um, and so, like, if I say it's Zimbabwe, then that's not true. If I say it's Rhodesia, that's also not true. Um, but also, um, this is going to be is the first of a series of novels that all are set in Zimbabwe. Uh, and I don't name it because throughout the country's history, it's had different names and different sort of like political identities. So I think it's good to leave it vague for those practical reasons. 
but also because I didn't want people to say, you know, there's that happened in Zimbabwe, and I can distance myself from it because I think some of the things that happen in the novel can happen anywhere. And uh, the story is sort of like, I don't really believe in universality, but I think it can translate into different contexts. And so that's why I did that. Okay, yeah. I already mentioned in the introduction um, that you hold a PhD in modern thinking and literature, and you also hold a bachelor in writing and literature and publishing, but your masters you did in film. Mm. So why did you switch to film? And why did you go back to literature for your PhD? Um, so, like in the, you know, most of you are very young here, so you won't remember this, but in the 90s, in the late 90s, um, or mid to late 90s, there was this boom of independent and foreign films that were just amazing. We had Quentin Tarantino, Jim Jarmusch, and they were all making these very amazing character-driven, multiple character movies with different points of view. And it was just, for someone who liked stories, it just was like a very immediate thing to fall in love with, because you're like, oh my gosh, you can tell stories this way too. Um, and I was, you know, I was at Emerson College and they had a film program, so I decided to take a screenwriting class just to see, you know, what that would feel like. Um, but it was just the, sort of like that moment in time where I think independent cinema was just so much in everyone's face that you, we all felt we could be like writer-directors and we wanted to be writer-directors. And so we went out and tried to be writer-directors, and then most of us failed at being writer-directors, and so we went back to what we had been doing before. Um, but I think also, like, I don't necessarily see the splits uh, in terms of genre and media and what you're doing. It's telling a story is telling a story, and you tell a story using whatever resources you have available. Mm -hmm. And coming from Zimbabwe, there's not a lot of money for film. There's not a lot of money for anything, really, but um, so if you want to tell a story, then you have to find the medium through which you can tell that story. And so that's why I've had, like, back and forth. Yeah, interesting. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, you were born in Zimbabwe, but for mm -hmm. your studies, you went abroad to the U.S., mm -hmm. and you also stayed in Sweden and in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And recently, recently, you decided to come back to Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So how did this relocation to Zimbabwe influence your writing? Um, it hasn't really at all, because <laughs> I just moved back home um, in September last year after having been away from home for 20-something years. Wow. Um, but like Zimbabwe has always been the thing in my imagination, like I just, I really love the country, I love the way it looks, you know, I like, you know, the smell, I, I just like everything about it. And so a lot of my imagination, wherever I am in the world, you know, sort of like even though it's imagination sort of like placed in Zimbabwe, like the things I'm imagining are the things that were so very prevalent in my own childhood and my own growing up. So I think like I just have always wanted to sort of like write from home because I've never had that opportunity to create from that space. And it's a place that I definitely intellectually and creatively sort of like is very much part of what I do and it just didn't seem it started, started feeling disingenuous to keep doing it from somewhere else. You know, it's like I'm writing about Zimbabwe, but I'm from I'm writing it from here. Like if I'm in that space, what kind of stories can I tell? And so I got home in September, and in October I started writing my second novel. Um, and in six to eight weeks, I'd written the first uh, draft. Now this is amazing because this novel yes, yeah. <laughs> took like ten years to write. Okay, and see. so it was, I think also just being at home and being in that space made everything so much more immediate for me and just made that process easy. And I don't know if that second novel is going to be born next year or whenever, but it's, it's the manuscript is there. So I think it definitely has helped. But, okay. yeah. Good decision, yeah. <laughs> so coming to your novel, The Theory of Flight, um, there is this motive of movement, which is very significant. Um, Jeannie's father is uh, fascinated by aeroplanes. Mm. Jeannie owns uh, only three items. One of it is a suitcase. Mm. And then there's all these cars. Um, it's a car where Jeannie and her childhood friend mm. play. And it's cars who kind of invade Jeannie's farm. Mm. They bring soldiers. And also after some years, they, the cars take away Jeannie's friend Marcus. Mm. So uh, why did you um, develop this motive of movement? Mm -hmm. I think uh, when you, so I think in many ways I am fascinated by the history of Zimbabwe and 
Zimbabwe, besides the, the violence that I talked about earlier, is, is a has been had a series of shifts, like actual movement shifts. So from people coming in, right? So you have my people who are the Ndebele coming in in the 19th century. You have uh, the Europeans coming in also in the 19th century. And then you have sort of like settling and, and creating that country, but then also beginning to move from the like the rural to the urban because of work and then moving you know to another country like South Africa also because of work. Mm -hmm. So I think like when we think about family and where it's located, there's always movement in that because we've always been a very sort of like people in transition. Um, and so for me, migration and sort of like the themes of this um, festival are very much part of, I think, like the Zimbabwean identity. And so when you say Zimbabweans are, it, it's sort of like you have to have this idea of travel and movement within it, uh -huh. uh, which is also what my PhD was about. Like, how do you then create a sense of belonging when people are always shifting their identities in this way? Um, so, yeah. yeah, it's an exciting subject, yeah. Um, also in the, in the introduction, I already mentioned Jeannie's father, um, Golit Gomede, mm -hmm. uh, and his aim to build an aeroplane. And Jeannie's father is almost obsessed by aeroplanes. He builds tiny model aeroplanes as a child. Later on, he's sent to the Soviet Union to study aeroplanes. And um, back when he's going back to his country uh, during the War for Liberation, he actually shoots down a real aeroplane, mm -hmm. making him the most um, wanted man by the mm -hmm. state. He actually gets chased by the state. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, is there a historical equivalent to this um, mm. character, how did this character come to you? So uh, basically it's two stories coming together, um, both of them sort of like have roots in reality. Um, so the first story is of the shooting down of the Vickers Vicon, which definitely happened at the tail end of the Zimbabwean uh, Rhodesia War. Um, and so that did create sort of like this huge racial tension because it was obvious that it had been what they called a terrorist act. Mm -hmm. Most of the passengers in the plane were whites and they were not in any way military, they were just civilians taking you know, on holiday and things. And so it was definitely sort of like a point <coughs> of contention in the country. Uh, but then also when I was growing up, there was this man who, would, who was featured on TV uh, who was trying to build a plane from scratch and you know, and I remember sitting there with the family, and everyone starts giggling, you know, and I'm thinking, why are they laughing? <laughs> you know? I mean, of course, I didn't understand that you can't actually build a plane from scratch, but, so it's yeah. but then I thought, well, what is it about building a plane, an African person building a plane that's so difficult, you know, like even for our own imagination to say, we can do this, right? And a lot of people thought he was crazy, and he had been a sort of like a liberation hero. And I thought, well, what is it about flying that this man wants to capture, and so I just, he, he's always really been in my mind since then, you know. Um, so I thought, I'll put those two things together. There's this real plane that fell out of the sky and created this tension, and then there's this man <coughs> whose sole ambition was to build a plane, and we didn't believe he could do it, you know. So what would that look like if he could have done it? Okay, so you combined the two incidents. Yeah. Okay. And speaking of men, um, after reading half of the book, I thought, wow, where are the fathers? Yeah. There's kind of an absence of fathers. Almost every character grows up without the father or is abandoned mm -hmm. by its father. And most of the women are single mothers. Uh, would you say this absence of fathers is something typical for society in Southern Africa? Mm -hmm. Or is this something that you constructed for the novel only? Mm -hmm. So I think that, that question is like very loaded. Because if you say yes, <laughs> and it's like, hmm. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll say yes, and then also no. So the truth is, um, because of the kind of history, and I, I'll reiterate again, I'm very much interested in history. Because of the kinds of history we've had, um, men have been the one who traditionally would leave the home to go look for work, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, what they leave there is a fatherless space. Yeah. They're not choosing to leave. They have to leave to go look for work, right? Same thing with war. When you go fight in a war mm -hmm. and you don't survive the war, you're not, you know, you're not coming back. back. And so because that's the kind of history that the, that's the context of the story, a lot of the fathers do leave. Now, um, so the grandfather leaves because mm -hmm. he's wanting to go work in South Africa, right? He tries to bring his family with him, but then that doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. Golide and his wife just disappear. And this happened a lot during that time. 
So it's not like an intentional, I'm not going to be there as a father for my children. It's because of the circumstances around which you know this is happening. At the same time, maybe this is also me. <laughs> I okay. actually was brought up by a single parent, so maybe I also am not used to writing fathers <laughs> <laughs> stories or thinking fathers, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's personal, because when you ask the question, I was like, really? I thought there were fathers everywhere, then I thought, oh, maybe they're not, you mm -hmm. know. So I think maybe that's also just a personal thing. I'm so mm -hmm. used to just seeing sort of like a very strong woman raising a child that maybe that's the story that just comes to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think definitely within the Southern African context, there's a lot of history that goes into having those mm -hmm. mother-headed households. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 